Welcome ladies and gentlemen from me, Guy Munson, to our regular six minutes strategy summary. As I returned to my desk last week, I looked at the market movements over the months since I last reported to you. Three things stood out. First, of course, the horrendous 44% surge in natural gas prices, leaving them up 300% for the year to date and an extraordinary six-fold higher over one year. This will wreak untold damage on consumer income incomes during the winter and may well need government support of the magnitude of the sort of levels we saw that funded the furlough programme in the Covid years. Second, UK gilts have climbed by a massive 76 basis points over the month as UK inflation fears and concerns over issuance mount. Finally, the dollar has continued its ascent, rising by another 3% over the month and is now up 13% for the year to date. Key will be Chairman Powell's Jackson Hole speech at the Central Bank Symposium, which he'll make on Friday. Against this tumultuous economic backdrop, equity returns have actually been remarkably stable, up 3% on the month. How is this possible? What does this mean for financial markets? And how do you invest against this tumultuous economic backdrop? will all be questions I'll look at in the slides ahead. So let's begin by looking at financial markets in a little bit more detail for the year to date in the left-hand panel. Asset prices are down, I'm afraid, across the board. Gold minus 5%, global equities minus 15% in dark blue. In light blue, gilts down extraordinary 17%, and the Nasdaq down 20%. But look at that rebound in the yellow Nasdaq line from the middle of the summer, up almost 21% at one point. A very strong mini rally. What caused this? Well, certainly lower volatility helped, you can see the VIX there. Investor sentiment was extremely negative. But most of all, I think, the uh, fall in oil prices from over $130 to at one point below 100 was a significant factor in improving the US inflation outlook. And I think that contributed to the rebound. So let's consider these financial markets against the real world events that were happening in the world and in Europe across the summer. I've shown in the left-hand panel the rise in natural gas prices. The light blue line, the Dutch European price, are up six-fold over one year. The UK natural gas price is up five-fold, and America up almost three-fold. Even that lower move in America, which of course is accounted for by the high level of domestic gas production they have, has pushed one in six households into arrears on their utility bills, an all-time record. On the right-hand side, the IMF very graphically shown the problems that this is going to create in Europe. It shows the amount of uh, disposable income that's going to be eaten up by energy price increases in blue for the richest 20% of households and in red for the poorest 20% of households. And you can see those red lines are significantly to the right of the blue lines, showing the pressure on the poorest paid. Look at that blue arrow, though, for the UK, where the effect is extraordinarily marked. Yes, it's painful for the richest 20%, but it's very painful indeed, with almost 15% of household spending eaten up by energy price increases for the poorer paid. So you can see the real urgency of getting a large and significant package out to support poorer paid families. The second big factor in Europe has been climate, of course. August saw 47% of Europe under some form of drought warning, as you can see from the map below here from the European Commission. The yellow dots are rainfall deficits, the orange dots are soil moisture deficits, and the red dots are wider overall alerts. We've not seen a map like this for 30 years. It was also a global phenomenon. We saw, for example, unprecedented droughts along China's Yangtze River. All of this contributed to higher input costs, disruption to supply chains, and of course even more pressure on household budgets and gas and electricity prices. The third significant event of the summer was of course the ongoing weakness of the Chinese economy. That's been a theme of these talks for most of the last 12 months. So weak was the Q2 numbers, they actually turned negative, minus 2.6% quarter on quarter. Extraordinary for China. Look at the economic data on the left-hand panel, I'd draw your attention particularly to retail sales, that light blue line, rising at just 2.7%. On the right-hand panel, you can see the slump in floor space started and sold in the Chinese property market, very weak, and that's affecting Chinese bank loans and mortgages, which again were particularly low for this quarter. All of this is pushing Xi Jinping to react. We've seen a big push on infrastructure spending, $146 billion announced this morning, and rate cuts and stimulus from the central bank. 
all this could be quite significant for world growth and may be a source of liquidity for financial markets in the months ahead. So what does all of this mean for equity markets? Well, extraordinarily, as I reported earlier, equities are actually up by 3% over the month. How is this possible? Well, yes, the input costs are horrendous, unit labour costs are surging, fuel and goods costs going into factory gates are surging, but for the most part, the companies we see are able to pass those costs on. That means that actual profits before tax and after tax in that right-hand panel for the US market are actually near to record levels. And indeed, we saw a robust reporting season in the US, slightly less robust in Europe, but nevertheless much better results than the wider economy. So I think this is encouraging. What does all this mean for asset allocation? Well, it's a bit of a policy tightrope. Inflation and recession risks rising together are difficult to manage. So we're significantly underweight bonds, worried about this continual sell-off and, of course, the beginning of quantitative tightening as central banks begin to sell down their massive pile of bonds bought in the COVID year years. In equities, we are underweight, but only modestly so. Cautious up till now of Asia, but perhaps a little bit more interested after the recent stimulus package. Uh, again, a tilt towards strong thematic names and low, strong and consistent dividend payers. In alternatives, our renewables portfolio is doing particularly well and infrastructure has been remarkably stable. In all of this, we kept a tactically high cash level, one, to avoid participating in the bond market successively, but two, as an opportunity to play some of the market rallies as we saw in the middle of the summer. Well, I hope all this is useful to you, gives you the beginnings of a roadmap for how to deal with this extraordinary economic volatility in your portfolios and gives you some guide to our strategy in the years ahead. Thank you.